Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance uh, YouTube channel and website. So today we have Mark Korsky, who's a political philosopher, anarchist, and author of the book um, Engines of Domination, as well as um, um, <coughs> he... I don't know how you would say, uh, <laughs> help to create the documentary based on the book, um, Engines of Domination, right? Mark Korsky's Engines of Domination. Um, so, Mark, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your history, how you became an, an anarchist, and, you know, things like that. How I became an anarchist was by grow, part, first by growing up in the 50s. It was the McCarthy years. Nuclear weapons were brand new, and we had advertisements for fallout shelters. On TV and newsreels of hydrogen bombs going off and duck and cover grills in school scared the hell out of me. I, I, I was good at science, I was bright, and I understood that this could be the end of the world. So I grew up with, with the communist democracy conflict, in, in, not just in my house where my father was a conservative Republican, but just everywhere. It was the atmosphere of the times. I grew up fairly well indoctrinated by my father, that America was the greatest country on earth, and our system was perfect, and the commies were out to destroy us, and we had to do anything to stop them. Uh, that began to break down in the Indochina War, the Vietnam War. I began to see what was really going on there. You only really had to read Time Magazine carefully to get an idea of what was going on, but it was a monstrous thing. Muai, dead kids, body counts on the evening news. Literally, they tell you how many Vietnamese were killed and there are these teeny number of U.S. killed. And it, it broke down further as, as the 60s moved on with their rebellions. And the turning point, unfortunately, in some ways, was that I fell in love with Ayn Rand in my late teens. I, I had never read any philosophy before. I had never dreamed that you could think about the world systematically. And use principles to arrive at conclusions and <clears throat> but having been indoctrinated by this right wing upbringing of mine I leaped into another indoctrination I indoctrinated myself with Rand I, I bought everything I, I, could, I could almost quote Galt's speech <laughs> wow. it was that bad <laughs> some, some close friends rescued me from that pretty soon I was no longer a Rand -roid. But what I inherited from her was a, a, a hatred of political power. Mm. She acquired that hatred under the, the atrocities of the Soviets after the Second Revolution. Uh, I saw that the United States certainly wasn't what my father thought it was and was actually, in, in some ways, just as brutal and dangerous a regime as, as the Soviets, with the nuclear standoff, with aggressive wars like Vietnam. So basically, by the time I turned 20, I decided I was going to think for myself for the rest of my life, that that was going to be my calling, and that political power as such, huge military states, whether it was the U.S. or the Soviet Union, were the problem with the world. We'd be better off without them than we could do without them. So that, in that sense, I was an anarchist by the time I was 20, and always have been. It wasn't a deeply thought out principled thing. It was it was just a response to how bad things were and how clear it was to me that if those kinds of institutions didn't exist, those these kinds of problems couldn't exist either and they shouldn't exist. So then it, I'll I'll jump ahead by I, I dropped out of school and went back to school because I was interested in the colonization of space. I'd pretty much given up on philosophy having any chance of saving the world. I'd originally thought things are screwed up because people's got screwed up ideas. And I realized that was absurd. There were much more powerful forces at work in shaping the way things happened than just what people thought. What people thought was important. But there were other things going on, and I really didn't understand them. The idea of a serious proposal for space colonies was made by a physicist named Gerard O'Neill. In, I guess, 1975 or 76, he and his students at, I think, MIT had figured out that 
large permanent orbiting settlements that could, could accommodate a couple thousand people in space. And idealist that I still was, and still as much in love with space flight as I was, I thought, wow, if we could only get independent communities in space, separate from the Earth and living in a rigorous physical environment where you couldn't just live any old way you pleased, maybe we could experimentally evolve better ways of living than with these giant military states. Of course, now I, I think that was really insane, but it got me going back to school because I didn't know any math or physics and I wanted to understand the engineering. Happened that that made me fall in love with math and physics, complete turning point. I turned away from philosophy, studied math and physics uh, seven years, including three years at the graduate level, and didn't think about philosophy much, philosophy of science a lot, uh, epistemology. Then I'd been working with a Jesuit spiritual advisor. I don't want to digress into that story, but they do these so-called spiritual exercises from a book by St. Ignatius. And as my last exercise, he assigned me to contemplate the newspaper every morning. <laughs> Shock of my life. Daniel, I could not understand what the events were going on at all. They were horrible. There were 70,000 nuclear weapons. Picture that. In fact, some people did picture it. Uh, a sculptor that I knew in Denver created a clay model of the U.S. nuclear arsenal called Amber Waves of Grain. Hmm. It's an installation piece of scale models of every warhead, every warship, every missile, every bomber in the United States nuclear arsenal, and it went on tour across the United States. You'd set it up in front of like a, a school or a, a public building. And setting it up was part of the performance art, hmm. and then people would come and look at this, and it was just <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. This was the, the peak of the anti-nuclear movement, mid-1980s now. So I decided I had to figure the news, I had to figure political affairs out for myself. And that took the better part of 10 years of just contemplating and thinking and coming up with different ways to think about it. I didn't study anything. I didn't study the anarchists. I didn't study uh, political science. I just thought. And by, by the early 1990s, I'd begun to have an inkling that there was a different way to understand this that if you looked at how human energy was being shaped by the institutions people lived under, you could use a th you could you could come up with a theory that actually used some physics in describing how political power worked. So to cut to the end, by about 10, 12 years ago, the theory had taken form, and I started writing the series of, of works that finally led to the book Engines of Domination, that's when I really became an anarchist, because I had, I think, a very convincing argument that political power is an intolerable evil that inevitably is going to destroy the world if it's not curbed and finally abolished. So it isn't that I, I arrived at anarchism from some kinds of moral principles, like non-aggression, or something like that. I looked at how natural communities work before political power emerged about 6,000 years ago, saw that they were relatively egalitarian and peaceful compared with what happened after the birth of civilization. They certainly weren't living in paradise, there was certainly conflict, there were certainly differences in role, but compared with kings and emperors and priests and slaves and warfare, uh, it was almost like paradise. That's how we naturally live. So something happened 6,000 years ago. What happened, I decided, was we're domesticators. One of the things, two of the things that make us stand out most from other species are that we make tools and we harness external sources of energy, most especially by domesticating plants and animals. And I decided that political power was an innovation when small groups of men learned how to domesticate communities of people. And in order to do that, like in order to harness any source of external energy, there, you can only do it in certain ways. And the things you have to do in order to domesticate a community function like an engine, a device that converts energy into useful work. And the necessary institutions I characterized as the components of the engine. And spelled out seven in particular that I think were a good way of looking at it. So this engine converts the human energy of a community into authority and privilege for the rulers at the expense of the community and its habitat. 
then once you've got any tool, when you use it, there are unintended consequences. If you just chop kindling, you get a pile of wood chips. If you put in a dam, you get a ruined river valley. There are always unintended consequences. So if you look at what has to take place if this tool is put into operation, you find that the unintended consequences include things like war, like a relentless race to create greater means of destruction, countermeasures against them, that political power must expand because it exhausts the riches of the region that it occupies and has to move on to further ones, uh, and most important that it inevitably, at a certain scale, is going to damage and finally destroy the habitat. So all of these unintended consequences of the tool in operation led to the situation that we're in today, which I call the human emergency. We're facing a set of unprecedented disasters that could exterminate humanity, frankly, or certainly put us into worse conditions than we've ever experienced before. Uh, certainly the threat of nuclear war is a huge one, not like it was in the 80s, but in some ways even greater, because the United States is doing everything it can to make a unopposed first strike possible with ABM technologies, by militarizing space with uh, anti-ballistic missile, satellite kill sats, and so forth. There are more nuclear powers than there have ever been, and the United States has its first strike nuclear policy, now, where the entire world knows, don't mess with us, we'll nuke you. It's been explicitly threatened against Iran most recently. Um, Israel has its, what's it called, the Samson option, some horrible euphemism for its first strike policy. Uh, so the, the nuclear war and the threat of nuclear war is part of the human emergency. The habitat is being destroyed at an appalling rate. If, if all of the destruction stopped today, we'd suffer the results of the destruction that's happened so far for generations or centuries. There are biological emergencies happening. The changes in the climate are causing catastrophic changes in the, in the habitat. Contamination from industry is damaging the habitat. Catastrophic changes in the entire world ecosystem are possible or even very likely. There are biological disasters that threaten us. As half the world's population is in cities now, and cities are high concentrations of stress and toxicity, pandemics like no one's ever dreamed of before are possible. Biological weapons research is creating the most virulent and dangerous possible kinds of pathogens. Supposedly they can contain them. We have a huge uh, activist movement going here. I, I live about 75 miles from the Los Alamos National Laboratory, where we're trying to restrain the development of bioweapons there. And then there's the spiritual side. An emergency is a situation that requires urgent and immediate action. The human spirit is being degraded by the system of corporate power around the world. Traditional livelihoods are destroyed. Traditional community substructures that have made life a rich and interconnected experience are being destroyed and people are becoming isolated and atomized. And live in, a, live in a, a world where so many of the things that made life meaningful and rich are lacking. That's another emergency. That's no way to live. And it's certainly not right that corporate power should be forcing or selling this way of life to people around the world without their knowledge of what, without, without their having a choice about whether to accept it and often without their knowing what they're going to have to give up in order to accept it. So that's the human emergency. So in a nutshell, my theory starts with looking at human nature and natural human communities, considers what kind of institutions you have to construct in order to harness human energy for the purpose of authority and privilege, looks at the consequences of using that tool which I call a tool for making tools of human beings, and concludes that the inevitable result is the human emergency. Therefore, political power must be abolished. It is intolerable. It's not because it violates a principle like non-aggression. 
It's not because it's unnatural. It's because it's a threat to all of our survival. Nothing could be more evil, more obviously evil. As to what should happen once it's abolished, I don't have anything to say about that. That should be up to the people of the world. And I don't even have any ideas about how to abolish it. I know it can be greatly reduced, and it has to be contained in some ways to avoid things like nuclear war. And to immediately, and as much as possible, cut back the environmental destruction. Because there's no time. There's no time to say a different system might be able to do it better. We're not going to be able to get a different system in place. This is the one we have to use to make these changes so there won't be a future. So that's in a nutshell how I got there and what I did. And what is described in detail in my book and presented in a, in a very simple condensed form in Justin's film. Yeah, I... Um I have followed a lot of um, Larkin Rose's work. I'm not sure if you're familiar with any of his stuff. Um, I've heard about it. But yeah, no. yeah, he's wrote a couple of books, and uh, and his recent one, which is pretty uh, well done, is uh, the most dangerous superstition. And uh, <clears throat> I read that, and that really um, cemented a lot of the anarchist principles in my mind about um, <clears throat> you know why. <clears throat> How is it that good-natured people, decent people, you know, like your neighbors and your family and your friends, you know, people who you consider to be decent, how is it possible that their belief in government can produce or encourage the type of violence that we see today, the institutionalized violence? And, 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 and it really showed um, how, you know, <laughs> government is like this big exception to morality. You know, how, you know, you can't rob your neighbor to fund your child's education, but you can vote for a politician to uh, tax him to fund your child's education, right, through public school. So, <clears throat> so, so there's, there's a giant exception of morality. So, so statism is, um, is inherently, you know, um, contradictory, hypocritical, and it, 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 it stands on no firm ground of morality. So... So that's one thing that he tries to, you know, and, and you're talking about how, uh, like you say, um, you know, how do we get rid of it, right? So basically, his approach is, is um, you know, statism is, it's like, your, it's like our belief in Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, you know, <laughs> we believe it because a lot of people, you know, talked about it and told us to believe it, so we just believed it, right? Not because, uh, you know, I guess you have any proof, scientific proof or anything, and and then when you find out that, let's say, Santa Claus is not real, what do you do? Do you have a, a violent revolution to overthrow Santa Claus? No, you, you just stop believing in Santa Claus and he has no more influence over you, over your life. So similarly with statism, it's the belief in the myth of authority, the belief that some people have um, are special rights over other people, can control other people, can steal their property through taxation, right? Can murder people and call it the war on terror, right? So... In my mind, that's how I see it. So that's my purpose in, in you know, what I write in my videos and everything is just educating people that it's just, it's a belief in, in a myth, you know. We're giving them power by voting, by petitioning them, by giving them attention, <laughs> you know. What, what do you think about that idea? About, I think very differently from that certainly believe that it's true that a great deal of what keeps political power in place is people's mistaken idea that it's a necessary and good thing, and that that's strongly encouraged by those in power, of course. But I can, I can think of systems of power that remain in power mostly by pure force, without the people believing that it's necessary or good at all. We're in a unique position. We're in a country that developed on the, on the, on the wave of the Enlightenment, with the the ideals of, of democracy and fraternity and liberty, and that in a country that was constructed supposedly according to those principles and with great reverence for those principles, and we've been sold a bill of goods that what we have is the is the unique way to embody those principles, and that that's what we've really got. So there's there's that's a huge factor in it, but that's thought control. Those in power have other means of controlling us. Uh, Santa Claus does not have the police, the courts, the army, 
and the corporate press in his pocket. Oh, yeah, <laughs> quite right. <laughs> See? Uh, so we stop believing in it, and with the police being militarized all over the United States, with the surveillance state in place, oh, yeah. <laughs> and with thought control, control still working very powerfully on a small, active, organized, and influential part of the population, political power is not going to go away. We're going to have to take organized action and unorganized action. People are going to have to come up with creative ideas spurred by situations in which they're really hurt and enraged, or those they love are really hurt. And there's no foreseeing what that will lead to, and there's no foreseeing what those in power will do in response to it. Uh, to me, ingenuity is critical in this. It took great human, we're incredibly ingenious creatures, and it took a great deal of ingenuity to create political power. It's going to take that same kind of ingenuity to overcome it. And creativity is creative because no one can anticipate what it's going to come up with. Mm -hmm. We can't anticipate what will be done and whether it can succeed. I'm optimistic some of the time because I see how much people have accomplished creatively. And I really believe that we're incredibly good creatures. There I agree with, uh, with Larkin, too. It's, a, it's only a very small number of people who can harm others without, without remorse, repeatedly and on purpose. And given institutions that require and reward and enable that kind of behavior, they can take over the world, and they have. But it's going to take more than a change of mind and attitude, far more, because they're not going to give up easily. They have the world to lose. And they know it. And they know there's rising opposition to them. But we're in for some kind of incredible drama that we can take part in as best we can. And I, I agree that it's of utmost importance to fight the thought control system, to do what you're doing, to do what I'm doing, and Justin, with the documentary, to help people see things more realistically or to encourage people who already do that they're right, they're not nuts, the system is nuts. That's critical, and the, more, the farther that can go, the better. Modern domination depends on thought control to a unique degree. For most of its history, it was the upper classes and the educated classes that were highly indoctrinated. The most indoctrinated person in the community was probably the priest. Uh, today it's very different, and this system could fail catastrophically, the thought control system, and cause the whole, system, the whole engine to lose stability and be vulnerable in a whole bunch of ways we can't imagine. So there's points where I agree, but there's critical points where I don't agree. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. <clears throat> uh, I, should, I should clarify Larkin's uh, position also, <clears throat> that it, it's it's not just about like, you know, you just like turn off a light and the <laughs> government doesn't exist anymore, but it's also about like, you know, through education, through talking to people and and describing, you know, first of all, you describe the harmful effects of government and political power, and then you describe how they got that power, right? <clears throat> because if you think about it, there are maybe a, a few hundred or maybe a thousand, um, <clears throat> you know, politicians or bureaucrats, or let's say politicians on Capitol Hill, and <clears throat> they control... 300 million, right? But how do they control 300 million, right? They're not actively robbing people, of course. <clears throat> they they control it based on the law enforcement, right? Law enforcement and military basically give the, the give the teeth to the uh, you know their violent uh, laws, with mandates, edicts, and things like that. So without those attack dogs of the police, you know. They would be just twisted sociopaths trying to control other people, <laughs> and, they, sure. and they would be sent to a padded room, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so that's basically what he's saying is that is that ultimately it is the sociopaths that are trying to violate, and, and the fact that there's that there's this um, institution called government where where you know really mentally unstable people can go to and are attracted to in order to, you know, control and subjugate vast areas of a population, uh, that is the primary problem that we have created and ballooned, you know, it's, it's swelled to such gargantuan proportions, this uh, institution known as government. And, and, and like, the, you're right, like, uh, there, there's a lot of violence, right, with the police and the military, and that's why it's so, so important to talk to them. They are really important. They are the... They are the guns. They are the you know the claws and, and the fangs that give it power, right? So 
talk to po talking to police is some of the it's, it's some it's like the most important thing to do right <laughs> pretty much and they're the most difficult because they're they're the protectors they're the guardians right of the rulers there's many guardians education uh, Howard Zinn wrote of the revolt of the guards near the end of his book The People's History of the United States where he was he was speculating on what might happen in a, in a democratic revolt in the United States. The guards include all kinds of professionals. The guards include the press. The guards include the mass media. The, there, are, there are many, many, a lot of scientists. I, I think it's I, another place where I disagree is in thinking that the, the government is the problem. Without it, the problem would be impossible. Granted, it's indispensable. But who rules this society is not the people on Capitol Hill. The thing on Capitol Hill is a mechanism that ruling elites use. And the ruling elites are, in the United States, maybe some 2,000 people that include top military positions, yes, but mostly top corporate positions. And they're the ones who, through the influence that they have on the state, get the state to do what benefits them. Mm -hmm. Without the state, they'd be powerless, yes. But the, the, the actual rulers, in the sense of my theory, the ones who use the engine, you could, there are those who actually operate it, that's Capitol Hill, but there's the one who direct the operation. And they're the ones who create policy, and they create it to benefit themselves. So you have a, a bigger structure. Thought control doesn't operate primarily through the government. Until recently, the United States government was forbidden by law to use propaganda within the continental United States. The thought control system is entirely done through corporate media and education. So it's a bigger thing than just the state. And I, I think by focusing hostility on the state, the ruling elites can deflect it from themselves and from seeing how the state is being made to serve their interests, and education is being made to serve their interests, and the media are being made to serve their interests, the media that they own. It's a bigger picture that I see. The engine is a bigger thing than the state. The state is an essential core component, but there are other components. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely, I agree. I mean, um, I, I, the way I think of the state is like a you know, uh, it's like the roots of a tree, right? And then you have all the branches or all the, <laughs> all the other um, um, appendages like, you know, public education, the media, um, you know, bi big biotech corporations, big energy, big, uh, you know, the big banks, things like that. And sometimes I think people can get caught up in what Monsanto is doing or what J.P. Morgan is doing or what Goldman Sachs is doing and uh, and make that the focus of their life like let's say for example the 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 wall street uh, what do you call that um uh, the, you know the protest night um occupy wall street right mm -hmm. so these people focusing on wall street right <laughs> and i don't know if you follow any of peter schiff peter schiff stuff he does a lot of great work uh, he's a uh, ceo of, Euro, of euro pacific metals he's a precious metals dealer but he, but he but he talks a lot about um you know anarcho-capitalistic theory and he basically he went to the wall street protests the occupy wall street protests and uh, i think it's ducati park and he set up a sign saying <laughs> i am the one percent let's talk <laughs> and of course they weren't too happy about that but they did talk and uh, and it was great because he was able to explain a little bit of the mechanism behind um you know how Wall Street is is able to get so enormous, right? So gigantic, which is basically the same reason why all the other, you know, special interest corporate groups are able to get so, you know, enormous. Um, and he was basically saying, "You guys shouldn't be here. If you really want to make a change, go to Washington D.C. <laughs> go pick it over there." But it's that's the way. That's just the way I look at it. It's like various hydra heads on the same monster, right? So, so you know, it's good to focus on those, but we should never. Uh, you know the media again. You know, you know, completely funded and controlled and filtered and censored by um, special inter interest groups and uh, you know and, and politicians. So, so that's those are things to pay attention, but not necessarily to focus. I think so. That's just my take. <laughs> what do you What do you think? Well, I'm thinking. <laughs> I haven't th these things much. I think about my own ideas and not. Oh, okay. How they differ from other people's. You know, corporate power was stringently controlled in the early United States. 
in the in the boom times that many anarcho-capitalists point back to is the golden age of capitalism. From the time of the Constitution, states wrote extremely restrictive laws regulating businesses or corporations, companies they were called, limiting how, where they could operate, how they could operate, fiscal policy, uh, ownership. Banks in particular were put under extremely tight control. And only toward the end of the 19th century did industrialists begin to erode these powers, one state at a time. And as they bought influence in those states and removed the controls, businesses relocated there, which put huge pressure on other states to remove those controls. And the removal has continued right to the present day. The boom time for it started in the Reagan administration. Regulation of, of business activity was so important in the early United States because these people had suffered under the companies, the, the Hudson Bay Company, the Dutch East India Company, the Virginia Company. These were monstrous tyrannies. They were not your free market, free exchange, uh, beautiful kind of human interaction. They were tyrannies with huge armies who enslaved people and tormented people and ruined people and slaughtered people. And at the time of the Constitution, it was it was considered to put those restraints into the Constitution, but it was left to the states eventually. So corporate power is advanced first by eroding those legal constraints. I don't agree that these things should not be restrained. The only way to control them, they only get their power by legal privileges, and those privileges can only be curtailed legally. On the other hand, at the same time, their interests, their lobbyists, have manipulated uh, the government into serving their interests through subsidies, through privileged land use, and stuff like that. It's a two-way, it's a two-way street. They got the obstacles to their operation removed, and at the same time, they got all the additional state force and influence that you're talking about. So, what's dangerous is power itself, whether it's corporate power state power, religious power, uh, undue influence by controlling how people get information and think. It's the ability of me and my group to get you and your group to act according to our intentions, no matter what form it takes or what institutions it takes to do it. I can imagine an amazing tyranny with no state. I can imagine, in the absence of a state, something like a total corporate fascism, where the land, instead of being primarily controlled by the government, is simply owned by the corporations. Where all of the resources are in their hands, and where borders are strictly controlled. I can imagine a worse tyranny than any we've ever experienced, with no formal government at all, where each region's corporate owner was the sole tyrant. It's the tyranny, it's the control. Human ingenuity. If if we succeed in just getting rid of the state, we might find ourselves in a even more horrifying situation than the one we're in now. We should concentrate on whether there are some people who can control others the, and capture their human energy to their own advantage by whatever means and be very alert to every means that can possibly be used that way. You know, when I when I talk to people about um, voluntarism or anarcho capitalism you know, they say, why are you against the state? You know, we, you're always living under some sort of government, you know, whether it's a condo association, whether it's a religious organization, <laughs> you know, any kind of organization you, you, you join, that's like a government, right? <laughs> but I, uh, the way I differentiate those entities from the federal government is, can it wage war? <laughs> can it print money? Can it spy on its citizens? <laughs> Can it kidnap them for, for possessing an unauthorized flower or leaf? <laughs> right? That is exactly that. That is primarily how I differentiate the federal government, and and so in a way, state power is extremely unique. Or let's say more specifically, federal state power is extremely unique, in that they have what's known as the monopoly on violence. Right? So. So they can arbitrarily pass a law, which is basically an opinion with a gun, just someone's opinion, and they just pass a law 
and right anybody who disobeys is um, you know um, kidnapped and thrown into a cage right and and that is an enormous power unlike um, religious power unlike any other power which does not necessarily entail this violence and not only do they have the violence but since they are authority right the, the state and government is considered as authority so they not only can hurt people but they have the moral right to hurt people right so people are believe that you know if you see somebody if a police officer is beating someone in the street you know some people may think you know what that person probably deserved it they probably did something to deserve it <laughs> it's easier to think then it's easier to think that way than to think that it's just brutality to put us down yeah yeah the state is certainly unique that way. Near the end of the documentary, I say, if government means the institutions that maintain peace and order within and among communities, then domination is obviously the worst possible form of government. I avoid talking about political power and identifying it with government for that reason. Communities always have organizations that make, it, make the community work, ways of resolving conflicts ways of carrying out per tasks. Communities usually have central kinds of organization for certain tasks. Like here, here in Taos, we have a, uh, an irrigation system called the Asequias. It's been here since the Spanish settlers threw the Indians out a few centuries ago. Uh, works great. It's democratic. The, each region has a, a, a director of, of the water in his area called a mayor domo. He's elected, and he decides when the water goes here and there. And occasionally you get a bad one who doesn't get voted out, but usually they do a good job or are voted out. You need central kinds of organization, but that doesn't mean you need something like the state's cent armed central authority to make things happen. You need things to facilitate things happening. And I think it's not a bad idea to call those government, like with a little G, governing like the governor on an engine. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, because when people become opposed, when people focus on the state exclusively and think we shouldn't, we should make it go away, they're robbing themselves of the, they're robbing themselves, no, they're blinding themselves to the fact that the government is the only tool we have for stopping the threat of nuclear war and ecological destruction right now, and it has to be done urgently. We need the damn thing for some purposes in our present predicament. That's, that's the way power works. It makes you, it puts you in a position where you have to make choices that you wouldn't have wished to make. Uh, and I'd like to think that the way an Amish community works is a good kind of government with a little g. And that we, the, the state has mutated what naturally works for human communities into a monster that turns against their well-being for the benefit of the rulers. But maybe it's just a semantic point. Yeah, but I think, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know, some people greatly oversimplify. And simply, yeah. you know, the state is the bad guy, yeah. and if we knock over the bad guy, then everything <laughs> will be hunky dory. Yeah. and it, it's way more complex of, than that. Of course, that's uh, that's of course the uh, the um, misunderstanding that you get when you talk to uh, people who uh, you know support the state. <laughs> they, they simplify like you're an idealist. You. Uh, it's never going to happen, you know, what are you doing, you're wasting your time. Um, but I've, I've read a, a lot of interesting books, um, I don't know if you read, um, there's one called The Market for Liberty, um, there's the non- oh, That's ago, von Hayek. Yeah. No, 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 that's um, oh, no, no. Linda Tan Tannen, Tan um, Tannehill? I'm sorry, yeah, I was thinking about The Road to Serfdom. No, no, no. I, I remember when the Tannehill's book came out. I was in the libertarian scene in those days. Oh, I knew okay. a lot of those people. I didn't know the Tannehill's book, like I knew Bob Poole. One of the found one of the the first people who ran Reason Magazine. So yeah, I, I was familiar with the Tannehill's book, but way long ago. I stopped reading long ago, and started thinking on my own. So okay. most any book you ask me about, I'm going to say I've heard of it, but I don't know. Okay, <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that uh, that book, um, as well as you know a few others, Nonviolent Zone is a more recent one, um, that they discuss possibilities of how a stateless society would deal with, um, you know, a foreign invasion, right, would deal with basic crime or, you know, dispute resolution, because these are the, these are some of the objections that some of, some people, some statists have 
when I talk about you know um, anarcho capitalism, you know, or or like what you what you said before, how um, you know without a state that the corporations would take over and would you know get control of the land, and you know that's like some people have said, you know, what if what if I have a corporation and I have a lot of money and I buy all the all the land around your house, and if you step on my land, <laughs> I have a right to uh, you know to kill you or whatever. Um, which is kind of a you know if you have to if you have to try that hard to debunk my assertions then I think uh, you're trying too hard <laughs> but there's some really great um, explanations as to you know in reality why some of those things are simply unrealistic they just can't they wouldn't happen you know um, and and how when you involve the state and actually the corporation the way I consider corporation is something that is completely married to the state, right? There is no such thing as a corporation without the state, right? It is a completely fictional legal entity um, that is um, empowered and supported and protected by the state. So, so without it, we would have, you know, businesses, we would have businesses, but they wouldn't have that shield, right? So if a business does, in a stateless society, let's say, if a business does harm its citizens, harm its, you know, inhabitants with, you know, a product or a service that it, that it renders, um, then they would suffer retaliation, like anyone, right? Like any person. So there would be no shield at all, you know. You know, you could person. I guess I assume the person would be able to go after the, the company as well as the owners, right? So, so I think that um, is kind of what we call moral hazard. It it encourages um, better behavior, whereas whereas you know corporations under you know with state protection encourages reckless behavior where you get all the you know BP oil spills chevron you know polluting in the amazon rainforest destroying you know small communities and you know various things you know the alaska oil spill all this kind of stuff where these people do not get um um they don't they don't feel repercussions for their actions right they get complete immunity mm -hmm. so so yeah, <laughs> that's all. I just wanted to say that you know that you know how a stateless society would function. It's a fascinating topic because a lot of people are genuinely um, fearful because all we've known is life under a government. That's all we've known. So so one um, one it's called uh, the logical fallacy of uh, antiquitatum, which is basically you know it has always been this way, so therefore it must always be this way. <laughs> Yeah, well, it hasn't always been this way. It's been this way for 6,000 years. Well, <laughs> and for most of those 6,000 years, it was only this way in small parts of the world where the big centers of power were. Peasant societies worked very differently. And before the Bronze Age, societies worked very differently. So that's my refutation of that. As for how a, a society without domination would work, I think people should envision everything they can and imagine every possibility. But we should... Understand that human ingenuity is greater than that. That when it comes to actually creating a freer world, I, I envision a long process, first of reform, and then of abolition, if we really to finally get rid of domination. Maybe it can be overthrown, maybe, maybe more dramatic things can happen. But people will think of ways of, we, what we haven't been able to do for 6,000 years is try different ways of living. Mm -hmm. As the power of domination is decreased, people can and will and already are within the system trying to come up with and test out and dream of new ways of living that are going to go beyond anything that we've envisioned before. Which is why I don't, I'll never talk about how I, thought, how I think sh things should be without domination. Am I, am I an anarcho-capitalist, an anarcho-communist, an anarcho-primitivist? <laughs> <laughs> None of the above. I believe we should get rid of political power. We should get rid of domination. And as we do that, it isn't going to be sudden. It isn't as if suddenly they're going to take the state away and we'll have to figure out how to do everything. Oh, my God. It's bit by bit communities can regain control of their own affairs. Mm -hmm. People can bit by bit regain control of their own lives. In some parts of the world, people will do that better than others. And they'll, they will find out by creative conjectures and refutations, as my favorite philosopher Karl Popper puts it, discover things that we can't imagine. We should try to imagine them, but I think it's really futile to get locked into debates about 
how it ought to be, because that's authoritarian thinking again. Exactly. Right. Should yep. we have capitalism? Should we have private land exactly. control? Should yep. we have communism? Yep. Should, uh, I have my own feelings about that, but it's a moot point. Yep. It's going to be decades or generations mm -hmm. before things are so much different that a substantial part of the world is functioning freely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> It's fine. It was pretty much done. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that uh, another thing I get from people is um, is if your um, anarchist society is so so much better, how would you deal with you know X, <laughs> which is kind of hypocrite or kind of I say contradictory because you know if I don't think anyone should rule, then me saying how things should work is kind of like me being the ruler, right? <laughs> Exactly. I'm dictating exactly. the way things should work. Uh, so yeah, you're right. It's completely conjectural, you know, theoretical. Um, but it's uh, it's an interesting uh, thought experiments. Um, so I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, so so tell everyone how they can reach you, how they can find your book and your documentary. Well, the easy way to reach me is Facebook. Uh, Mark M A R K C O R S K E. There's also an Engines of Domination page. The documentary is. All you need to do is Google Engines of Domination. It comes right up. Um, there's now, just as of yesterday, there's a, an Engines of Domination channel on YouTube where we've collected all of our all of the, uh, the interviews I've done. We now have four translations of the documentary already. People have volunteered and translated into Greek, Polish, Spanish, and Romanian. Oh, my wife is Romanian. Very nice. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, should have her check out the translation. Excellent. Uh, two more translations are underway, one in Portuguese and almost for certain one in Russian. And I've been in contact with someone about possibly doing one in Hindi. So those will all be gathered right. in the Engines of Domination channel. What else? Uh, my book, Engines of Domination, is available on Amazon, or also it's distributed by AK Press, the big anarchist distributor in Oakland. There's also a Kindle version. And I don't, I think that pretty well covers it. I really encourage people to watch the documentary. If, if my ideas sound interesting at all, it's a brilliant film. Justin Jasuski, the filmmaker, contacted me after he'd read my book. I looked at some of his work, was dazzled by it. And he spent nine months producing this non-stop, beautiful, stimulating vessel for my essential ideas. And I don't want people to agree with me, Danilo. I, my whole purpose in writing the book and then in working so hard in the documentary with him is to make people think about these issues, as you were saying back before, to challenge things. And if, if people think them through and come to different conclusions, that's fine, but they're thinking about political power. And if people like the documentary, certainly please share, uh, upload, download, mirror, burn the thing freely. We're we're hoping to enter it in some anarchist film festivals next year. Oh, right. And get that to an even wider audience. But the initial response has been amazing. In under two months, it's had 30,000 views. Excellent, yeah. Very good. And uh, we're hoping for some developments in the near future that might give that a big boost. It's a labor of love. You know, I've put decades of my life into thinking about this. Justin has put decades of his life into becoming a brilliant filmmaker. And we work together to make something that we hope will be a real treat, even for people who completely disagree with it. There's some scenes in it that are gut splitters and tear jerkers, I think. So please watch the film. Uh, think about it. And talk to people about what you think about it. Pro or con. Get, keep your mind on this problem that we all have, this problem of domination and what's wrong with the world and what we can do to make it a better one. Yep, I uh, saw the film and it's excellent, highly recommend it. Um, excellent footage, excellent uh, narration. So, <clears throat> I definitely recommend it. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Mark, for the, um, for the opportunity to interview. Well, thank you, Danilo. It's been really fun. I really look forward to this. You're welcome. No problem. So this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance Network uh, signing off. Um, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.